Friday, August 13th, 2021. A day considered unlucky for some, but for fans of the Payday series, it's known as a day of celebration. Payday 2 turned 8 a few days ago, which blows my mind to be honest. I've been thinking for some time what would be the best way to celebrate another year of heisting, and as a purveyor of nostalgia myself, decided it would be best to go back. Way back, back before the White House, The Secret, Weapon Skins, Infamy, and even before Death Wish. Back to release day. 2013, a simpler time. A 16 year old Noli wakes up, turns on his PC, downloads update number one, and sees this. The rest is history. But I want to enter back into that headspace and see exactly how Payday 2 felt all those years ago. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Using some Steam trickery, I've reverted my install to the day one patch version. It's not the easiest process and I'm not going to be responsible for you all trying to emulate this and deleting your save files, so I'll leave the guide in the description. But if you're more interested in playing Payday 2 with all the bells and whistles of 2021, why not consider a purchase of one of my heisting branded PCs from Apex? The guys at Apex Gaming PCs make custom built desktops and have partnered with my channel to bring you a Payday theme line. These were designed with Payday 2's requirements in mind and even with an eye to the future with Payday 3 on the horizon. If you're a console player bemoaning the lack of content, these could be just the window you've been waiting for into the wonderful world of PC Payday. Take a look at my creator page, link below, and remember the code NOLI for 5% off if you're interested. That said, I need a format to best showcase the madness that is release Payday 2. How about a 2013 Payday challenge run? Without a doubt, this will force me to play enough of the game to get a real feel for how it played back then. Of course, Payday didn't have a story mode at launch, so my usual rule set is not going to fly. Instead, this run has one goal only. Beat every heist on overkill difficulty. To do this, I'm setting no limiting rules. That means any strategy, build, or glitch is fair game. This is all about exploring those old broken mechanics, not really testing my Payday playing skills. Oh, and for reference, Overkill was the hardest difficulty in the game at launch, and it was tough as nails. Maybe not Death Sentence tough, in that it was somewhat accessible to any build or playstyle, but still a real slog, and back then the game was even more focused on teamwork and communication, so diving into this solo is going to be seriously tricky. Also, all missions are not unlocked from the get-go. I need to reach level 40 to even play Big Oil, and getting there is not going to be the breeze it is today. To top it all off, you can't choose your heist or difficulty. It has to appear in CrimeNet to be played. Yeah, Payday 2 at launch was strange. All that said, let's do this. I'm ready to reminisce, and as I load into the game for the first time, I'm given plenty to recall. For instance, there's not a lot going on at the main menu. Scrolling through the settings, I realized just how bare bones they were. No numbers, just sliders, which is still the case for some settings to this day, but far fewer options are available overall. These are going to take some serious tweaking as we go, but for now it's time to get reacquainted with how weapons and skills worked. First I switched over to Wolf. He was my favorite character at launch and I may as well enjoy him for the complete man he was before he was all spliced up. It's a motherfucking man! Also, notice this is Hoxton, now known as Houston. Confused yet? Well, taking a glance at my weapons, it was of course the old faithful Amkar and the Shimano, bringing us back to the real world. I'm all too familiar with these bad boys after the last challenge run, although using them in this video makes me realize just how blessed I was to be stuck with them in 2021 as opposed to 2013. Weapons in this game kicked like mad, and it was also pretty unclear what their stats actually were. Just like the settings, there were numerical values hidden behind sliders for the numerically challenged. I'm glad Overkill realized we could handle some actual hard figures in the game instead of Nintendo S patch notes. These stats were known formally as damage, accuracy, mobility, visibility, noise, and recoil. Some of these you will be familiar with. Damage, accuracy, visibility, and recoil all exist within the game now. It's just recoil was renamed to stability, and visibility is now called concealment. Mobility and noise are gone altogether though. I think mobility did have some bearing on movement speed, or at least aiming when moving, and noise, well, I'll get onto that later when you see it in action. As you can today, you could also apply mods to your weapons to customize these stats somewhat. 
However, back then they were fairly limited and genuinely hard to come by, with randomised card drops being the only way. As for skills, well they were actually pretty cool, and there was some merits to the old system I think. I'll get onto talking about them more specifically when I actually have some points to throw around, just know that you had to pay for them, and when respecking, you only received a meagre percentage of that cash back, meaning the cash grind was real in this game, and builds were a lot more permanent. This led to people identifying more as a specific type of player, be they ghosts, masterminds, or the almighty tech forces. I really like this player identity, and feel like that cooperative role-playing element has been lost somewhere along the way. As for me right now, it is time to make inroads and visit the old tutorial, the safe house. Not the swanky new one, but the old laundromat which had me feeling all kinds of ways. This one was only taken out of Payday 2 recently I believe, as it could be accessed by new players. But this place screams Payday 2 more than any other location I can think of, even the Harvest and Trusty Bank. Of course it still exists within the safe house nightmare added in Halloween 2013, but it's not the same, and something about heading back here and seeing Lady Liberty hit a real nostalgia chord. As he did those 8 years ago, Bane guides you around, teaching you how to mask up, carry bags, and shoot guns in the firing range. This tutorial was bare bones and definitely didn't suffice as a good launch pad, but knowing all I do today, I kinda like it. Not to mention the mask and weapon display room is really cool, and the underground crime net atmosphere has not been replicated, so I miss you old safe house. Originally, it was planned that you could expand and customise this place, which we sort of got in the second safe house, but I think the original plan was actually a more ambitious base building sim, hence why none of those expansions actually made it to the game. Heading back into CrimeNet, it was time for my first heist. I'd need to build up quite a few levels before I could start on the overkill heist and completing the challenge. But this is where Payday 2's original design philosophy hits hard. There was no contract broker. Overkill originally wanted it to be a very organic and random experience, leaning into the idea that CrimeNet was a constantly moving criminal network and you'd have to take what you could in terms of jobs. If you're playing online, it was possible to seek out certain heights, but solo, you're at the mercy of what CrimeNet wants to throw your way. This is the first, and spoilers last, real challenge of this run. If a heist or difficulty wouldn't spawn for you, tough. Fortunately, we're lucky enough to find a jewellery store, getting things underway with a stealth heist. As such, I put my first point into the ECM jammer, suppressed my Chimano, and headed downtown. This was on very hard difficulty, which is a joke nowadays, but back then it was the second hardest in the game, which I was reminded of the hard way after stealth went awry. Honestly, civs are really bad listeners in this game, likely because there is a skill at the top of Mastermind designed to make them actually pay attention. Run number 2 went just as poorly, and instead of suffering through another tough gunfight moving 8 bags, I decided just to start over there and then. You may have noticed that I also only have two AI with me. I have no idea why that was how things used to work. As I've alluded to, Overkill really wanted to encourage online team play, so they did make the AI a little on the weaker side. I mean, they do good damage, but they have minuscule health pools when compared to the bullet sponge bots of today. Third time, as Bane says, I decide to go postal. I mean, there's no reason to keep civs alive when I have no spending cash to lose in cleaner costs. This scorched earth technique is a lot more effective, making out with all 10 available bags and a lot of blood on my hands. Immediately, you can see we're not in Kansas anymore. Only two levels worth of experience from level 1 on the second highest difficulty. Rough. If I was going to make it to Big Oil before Payday's 8th birthday, I was going to have to find some solid grinding methods. That in mind, it was time to start splashing the cash and get leveling. I decided to head into Mastermind now to pick up Cable Guy. That's because the fast learner skill is in this tree, which simply increases the rate at which you gain XP. Since we're looking at the skill menu now, I do want to talk about some weird and wonderful skills Payday 2 had at launch, and touch on how the system changed once perks were added. You see, back then, core perk deck skills were found in skill tier bonuses. For instance, dodge was a byproduct of building the ghost tree. You simply got better at dodging by building it. This was not the best way of doing things, and I think perk decks are a superior solution, but wish they weren't the only source of survivability in-game. Anyway, there were loads of weird skills in the game at this point. For example, improved crafting had no in-heist application, it simply made weapon and mass making cheaper. Smooth Talker says that it makes you more convincing when you interact with a pager, which literally means it gives you 4 pager uses instead of 2. 
You even have skills such as Chameleon, which states that civilians and enemies find you less suspicious, or a tier bonus that simply says you gain increased stealth. Like, what does that even mean? I'm guessing it's just free concealment, but it's also vague and confusing. I love the old RPG elements, it was full of weird charm, but it really wasn't well put together as a complete system, and again, trusted our smooth brains with only the bare information we could handle. Also, rest in peace old silent killer, this skill was pretty rubbish at launch I think, but after being buffed, this was pretty much high meta in every build for a couple of years. Inspire was also even more busted back in the day, it didn't used to have a cooldown, so one team member with it could revive the entire crew in seconds. Enough said about skills, I liked how they gave value to money and think they were great role playing tools, but they were not well balanced. For now, I just want the ones which make grinding a little bit more bearable. After buying a more loud orientated secondary in the cross kill, I head off to more crasher which just happened to show up. This does not go well. Grenades were added in the first DLC, so the usual route is bust. Using bullets to destroy them all takes ages and leaves me with very little ammunition. I was also reminded of how strange flashbangs were back then, like they just go off and there's nothing you can do about them. Again, very hard loud is a bit too difficult when I'm heisting with the Chuckle Brothers over here, so heading back to the drawing board, it's time to get the first of 10 heist completions I'll need on overkill. That's right, as I'm counting bank heists as just one mission, there were only 10 in the game on launch. Crazy how far we've come with roughly 70 today. Anyway, it's another jewelry store, which I again turn into a bloodbath as I just can't trust the alert icons in this game. They're so buggy, disappearing or staying on my screen forever as they see fit. It's hard to really notice the increase in difficulty, so again, I make it through even on overkill. One down, nine to go, and thanks to increased risk bonus, I reach level six. Notice the weird star rating risk level which Heist had? Heist had arbitrary risk levels which could be increased by the difficulty level. Beyond that though, later Heist could be played at higher risk levels for increased payouts. For example, Rats could be a 10 star Heist or a four star Heist depending on which one appears on Crime Net. It's all kind of complicated and I'm glad they simplified it. Anyway, up next, an overkill 4 stores appeared, another heist that can be fairly easy to stealth early on. Except, 4 stores had changed dramatically since Payday 2 launched, simply because of how ATMs and their loot work. First of all, loot value didn't scale with difficulty back then, making it hard to leverage this heist to make a quick buck from. But more importantly, ECMs couldn't open cash machines at launch. This meant that the only way I could steal enough loot to progress on this heist was by cracking one of the large safes. This was no easy task with how stealth worked back in 2013. Not only would camera detection in casing mode often ruin attempts, sieves couldn't be moved around once cable tied and you needed a skill higher up in Ghost to actually body bag corpses. This meant that 4 stores was unbelievably awkward to solo stealth. In fact, I found that if the large safe didn't spawn in the back of the coffee shop, it was virtually impossible. That meant resetting until it did, tying up the identical twins in the back, and waiting out the full 5 minute drilling duration. Tedious, but doable, as I completed it on the 4th attempt. Discovering this strategy was huge for the progress of the run. It meant that I had a cleanly farmable heist to earn extra early levels in, which would be essential if I was to get past the finicky systems in the game at launch. This was evidenced by my first attempts at stealthing bank heists. You see, back in the day, NPCs were alerted by very different things. Instead of it really being about time spent in their line of sight, detection change had more to do with running and standing, even for a moment, in their view radius. Even worse, weapons made noise even when silenced, making long range kills incredibly risky to pull off. This was something that was going to take some serious getting used to. Not to mention with my current arsenal, it was clear I wasn't ready to go loud on higher difficulties. As such, as the lone 2013 Payday player in 2021, it was time to grind. But before I condemn myself to a life of waiting for drills, I decided to test out money gaining strategies by playing through a normal difficulty watchdogs. Normal back then was probably about equivalent to overkill today, so it still wasn't going to be a walk in the park for me at level 8. But after 20 minutes of classic heisting, watchdogs normal was complete. 
It's weird, it's not the easiest to pin down exactly what was so different back then. AIs still operate similarly, but assault waves don't seem to be as intense or last quite so long, and civilian rescue units exist, meaning it feels a little more like a legitimate police assault rather than a horde shooter. I think in many ways classic loud gameplay still holds up, even if you can grab bags through walls. Oh, and specials didn't have their voice lines yet, so we're just eerily silent. From the Watchdog's completion, it's clear that longer heists have superior financial rewards, but still pretty crappy XP payouts. So back to four stores I go. Eventually I got this down to an exact science, grinding through several runs and making it to level 11. Remember new heists are unlocked every 10 levels, so now I can take on rats, the old faithful, for EXP runs. Back in 2013, you could actually intentionally blow up the lab and escape without any bags of meth on day one. This turned a 15 minute plus heist, where Bane gave even less accurate instructions than he does today, into a two minute one, meaning you just had to speed through day two and hope the intel was burnt in time, and then escape the bus on day three with just a single bag, meaning sub 10 minute completions were a possibility. Of course, escapes were a massive pain in the ass back then, but it was still a reasonable method to farm up some experience, meaning I had more options to farm rather than just waiting for four stores to appear. Trying to add even more variety into the cycle, I took on Ukrainian job, but was rejected at the first hurdle. I also gave Nightclub a go, which was doable, but pretty slow paced, and at higher difficulties still offered way more challenge than I was prepared for. I did have the car 4 at this point though, which is a huge upgrade over the AM car, and was considered a meta option back in the day. By now, I had the cash and experience to pick up fast learner aced and smooth talker, meaning heist and stealth should start to go a little better. How wrong I was. Everything about stealth in this game just feels so alien to me, and so standard bank heists were still off the table unless I wanted to slog through them in loud. Speaking of, I was gaining some confidence in loud gameplay thanks to some very hard completions of rats and watchdogs, tremendously boosting my coffers in the process and enabling me to pick up some higher level skills. Except I'm an idiot. I saw I had enough points to start going for higher tier ECM skills, but forgot just how punishing it was to re-specialize on your wallet. In doing so, I was left with half the build I had before, and now in need of even more slow paced grinding. The whole plan was to get two ECMs so I could speed run jewelry store, which I eventually obtained and pulled off just as planned. The hope was that my muscle memory on jewelry store speed runs would carry me through and be marginally less monotonous than the four stores farming. It may well have been, and the loot card bonuses could have seriously helped. But, and this is a big but, there was still no way to choose the heist, and waiting for a normal jewelry store to appear every time was about as tedious as waiting for the drill on nightclub or four stores. So of course, I was back to the drawing board. My coffee shop, prison. Rats still offered the occasional rest boat, but was still very possible to fail, especially with how few combat skills I had. Not to mention, back in the day, shields and dozers were way more dangerous. Dozer faceplates had about three times the health pool, and there were no explosive options to deal with shields. You simply had to flank them. Even though medics and cloakers were not yet in the game, specials were still more intimidating at this point than they are today. Undeterred, however, I decided to take on another heist at the Overkill difficulty. This time, it was Vlad's Moor Crasher, which was also changed a fair bit since 2013. At first glance, it looks harder as there are no explosives in the game to speed through the destruction process. But strangely, back at launch, Twitch used to wait for roughly a minute after going loud, meaning if you were fast enough, you could escape in the van you arrived in, an easy enough strategy for a group, which I hope to emulate by interrupting comms with a couple of ECM jammers. Naturally, this was a big failure, and it actually took me more than four minutes to reach 50 grand worth of destruction. But even so, more crash was an easy enough heist, and the AI pathing was even weaker back then, so hiding out in the gym was a very legitimate strategy, allowing me to wait out the arrival of the chopper escape and secure my third overkill completion. More Crasher was now another heist I knew I could complete for reasonable reward, diversifying the gameplay just a little more. After hours of painstaking grinding, I was finally at level 30, and a new option opened up for me. The over 9000 saw offered a new farming tool, especially for clearing four stores, thanks to the ATMs. 
The sword was actually kind of decent as a weapon back in the day too, so this plan was vastly superior to the last few. It was actually speeding up the leveling process, but the XP required increases at a pretty extreme rate from here on in, so it's still painful. With me losing my primary for the saw, it was also time to whip out the legendary secondary, the Locomotive 12 gauge. This thing was a monster back at launch, benefiting even more so from the weird way Shotgun Buckshot worked. But even with it, I was still too much of a glass cannon to really control overkill firefights. I attempted to take on my fourth overkill heist in nightclub, but was simply swarmed. Something went terribly wrong by the way, like the cops just seemed to stop paying attention to me just to kill bot Dallas over and over again. This looked cathartic for them as they only decided to do the same thing to me when I stood up. Some bugs actually make the game better. But I'd seen this heist was possible for me to complete loud if I played a little more aggressively and prevented that swarming, especially if I had some more armor, equipping the combined tactical vest for good measure. On my second attempt, things went much better. Still messy, but I was able to get through to the loot a little bit faster and went for an escape from the upper balcony, dropping down and making it out despite being grey screened. Over a third of the way to completion and I was clearly overconfident at this point, deciding now is the time to take on watchdogs on overkill. This one was hugely RNG dependent. If I had an unfortunate bag secure location, it was over, as the first couple of attempts showed. But if I only had to drop off four bags at the rear of the warehouse, things were a lot more manageable, making it through day one with my ancient meta car 4 locomotive build and actually holding things down on day two, even as my AI companions were bleeding out on the floor, securing most bags for the best payout of the entire run. With all that extra experience and cash lining my pockets, I was encouraged to make some build adjustments. The big investment here was in shaped charges. Now for anyone who's played Payday 2 at launch, you'll know just how essential they could be. They had application almost every single heist and single-handedly encouraged Overkill to bring out the Titan safes to prevent us from rushing all heists in the game. Well, Overkill had no power where I was playing, meaning speedruns were back on the menu. First up, Overkill difficulty Ukrainian job for completion number six. At launch, the van stayed for absolutely ages after the alarm went off, meaning we could waltz in, see for the safes, and escape with the tiara completely free of risk. This was also the most efficient farming method back in the day, if I remember correctly, so as long as Ukrainian jobs kept appearing, I'd be leveling smoothly. But it's never that easy. Waiting out heist appearances was a nightmare even with only 10 heists available, leading me down some, shall we say, darker paths. You see, I remember there being a glitch you could perform where you could restart a heist after receiving the reward. Not only could this save you from having to wait for another one to appear, but you could also use it on day three of a heist such as rats to rapidly farm three days worth of experience in minutes. Except, I forgot this was patched out on PC pre-release and it only really worked on the Xbox 360 edition of the game. So I was foiled once again. Instead, I'd have to obtain those final levels I'd need to take on the likes of Big Oil and Framing Frame the old fashioned way. That meant a traditional 2013 run of Overkill Rats was up next to see if I had what it took. Day 1 was massively assisted by C4 dealing with dozers in one blast, blowing up the lab and escaping out the window. The ensuing overpass escape was really not so bad, bringing me to the deal. Shape charges made this section infinitely easier, blasting through to the intel so I didn't have to wait out the gangsters burning it, and on day 3, which is a comparative walk in the park, I strolled down the highway taking out the Mendozas for our good ally and definitely trustworthy contractor Hector, and make it out in just over a minute. With rats complete, all loud orientated heists were cleared on overkill. Outside of day 1 of Firestarter, sneaking was now the top priority. So I took one final respec with the 60 skill points I had to mess around with, picking up skills like Cleaner and Shinobi Aced, as well as ECM Overdrive. Another important skill to all stealth builds was Dominator. Back in the day, you could dominate a guard in stealth and avoid their pager going off. Not to mention, at least in the release version of the game, they ceased to exist on the map altogether, so wouldn't be spotted, which is as ridiculous as it sounds. I also finally decided to splash the cash on some higher concealment attachments I'd happened across during the run to get my visibility down to low. After ages waiting for one, an overkill fire starter finally showed up. 
Day one is a massive pain. Depending on how many weapon cases you're tasked to recover, the location of the loaded warehouse, and the fuel tank to destroy them with, your mileage will vary. After a few unsuccessful attempts, I started resetting until I only needed to grab four bags, meaning I wouldn't need to drill the trucks. Of course, back then the AI couldn't help carry, but bags could be moved through the walls of the warehouse, saving quite a bit of time and allowing me to maintain cover. Backing off up the hill, I decided it would be easier to just steal the shipment and made it out with comparatively little resistance. Day 2 was always my stealth kryptonite when I first played this game and I can see why today. The FBI officers are densely populated with security and guards are able to notice open wire boxes from across the entire map. Surprisingly though, I was starting to get the handle on the old stealth movement. Jump crouching was way more important than it is today and guards could still have their line of sight interrupted by any physical object. I cut the wires, lockpit my way into the server room and ECM the door open, right as one of the panels I'd forgotten to close was spotted by a guard. This meant the alarm was raised, but the server was already safely outside the security gate, meaning there was nothing stopping me fleeing the scene immediately with very little initial resistance. Finally, on to day 3, of course this is just a regular bank heist setup, how hard could it be? The answer, very. With the bank being as small as it is, it's basically impossible for me to shoot on this map without alerting the entire place. That meant a ton of patience was required, destroying cameras to lure out the guards and take them out silently. Unfortunately, guards back then followed even more rigid paths, so I could be waiting upwards of 10 minutes for one to go where I needed him to. This was tedious and led to me rushing and getting caught on numerous occasions. Not to mention how quickly alert was passed between civs back then, making the tellers and their panic buttons a serious issue. To add insult to injury, on my very first attempt I made it all the way through, clearing out all four guards, only to fail when a civ called the cops, despite me repeatedly standing in the area and telling him to get down. The lack of alert signals makes civ control really not worth the hassle. I was going to be merciless in the future with civs, if I needed to be. Finally, I started to realise that I was at the mercy of RNG here. If the vault spawned on the far side of the bank, it was possible to drill without controlling all the civs. Even better, if the office staff didn't spawn an earshot of it either. After over 15 failed stealth runs of Harvest and Trustee, I was rewarded with some sympathy RNG and had the entire side of the bank to myself. This meant I could sit and drill without ever coming into contact with the civs. At this point it was just a waiting game, drilling for almost 10 minutes, burning up the mark cash for another 2 and escaping with a few bars of gold and my stealthing dignity just about intact. Just ignore the run where I failed due to getting electrocuted despite having a keycard in my pocket. After this exercise in resilience I decided I was glutton for punishment and wanted to go again. A standard cash bank heist was on the menu and almost unbelievably I completed it first time. I didn't have the best setup ever, but the guards decided they wanted to head outside for whatever reason, meaning they were easily dealt with, and I decided it was no mercy for civs this time around. After more waiting for drills to drill, I was finally on the home straight. Just two more missions for complete Payday 2013 dominance, both contracted by the elephant. If I remember correctly, these were the true bragging right missions back in the day. Framing frame clears showed you as the stealth god you were, and Big Oil was essentially proof of your nuclear physics degree. Difficulty wise, Big Oil was notorious though, so I decided to leave it until last and headed to the art gallery. Not a whole lot has changed with this heist over the years other than a more detailed pre-planning being added. It's still a case of find the mark paintings, hope the lasers spawn in a decent location and get out without being detected to avoid the ambush likely happening on day 2. I systematically took out the guards, moved the paintings across the roof or out the front door, and then ran as fast as I could once I ran out of pages, just about making it out before the alarm was sounded. This meant that day 2 was a walk in the park, despite civs already being alerted as I walked through. This has to be another of those infamous payday bugs. Day 3 is where ghost boys are turned into ghost men, the true payday 2 stealth experience. True to form, I tried shooting a lock on the roof and alerted the entire penthouse apartment. Run 2, however, was infinitely more successful. There were only 4 guards on this entire heist, meaning you can functionally clear the entire map of threats and complete the heist uninterrupted. Of course, in later updates, they'd add additional guards and reinforce security to avoid strategies like this, but I was actually really fond of doing full map clears back in the day. 
When it came to the coke planting section of this run, I even smashed open the skylight to throw the bags down faster. It turns out this was incredibly risky and a poorly conceived plan, which I wasn't punished for. You see, when I was moving the gold later in the heist, I decided to open up even more of the roof, getting detected by a camera in the process, something I really should have destroyed before proceeding. I was instantly detected, but fortunately close enough to the escape to get out before the alarm went off. A classic Noli stealth cock up, but not one bad enough to fail the mission, meaning I can say for certain I'm the best stealther of 2013 payday in 2021. Probably the only one. At last though, just one more hurdle stood in my way, the dreaded big oil, the heist which steam guides were made for. Hell, it even only existed in pro job format, making it extra punishing except I had the technology of 8 years of progress behind me. In other words, I had the big oil solver open on my second monitor. But even with this innovation at my back, there was still one slight issue. Finding the bloody heist. I know for a fact that big oil can spawn on overkill difficulty after level 40, but the odds of it doing so are seemingly minuscule. I waited and waited, when one popped up and very hard I decided to head in and do some recon for the big heist. Yep, this was going to be difficult, especially without C4 for day one. Even so, I forged onwards, waiting at the crime net menu for what seemed like days. In actuality, it was about three hours of opening and closing the game to reset the heist pool on rotation. At the time, I was working towards a deadline. This video was meant to be a celebration of Payday's birthday. That's not how it ended up, but even so, there was only so much time one can spend staring into the bleak abyss of crime net before you ask yourself, why? I waited and I waited and nothing came. Big Oil had eluded me once again. The true final boss of Payday at launch was actually finding the heist you wanted on the difficulty you wanted to play. And this was an enemy that I could not best. After hours I threw in the towel, I may not have been able to play the heist on overkill, but I could sure as hell beat it on any other difficulty. I settled for very hard, heading into the biker hideout which is just a completely different feeling map. Not to mention, the ECM rushing strategy straight up doesn't seem to work. Sadly, there's also no way I'm stealth killing all of these guys, they're too close to each other and will hear my shots. I just tried drilling for the intel silently, but ended up getting spotted and forced my way through day one loud. Fortunately, the cops seem to only really spawn from one direction and the house offers ample cover for the first assault wave, after which I was easily able to make it out. An escape was triggered, but the car chase really isn't that difficult, especially with how inaccurate snipers seem to be back at launch. If only that was the case these days. Day 2, however, is where Big Oil gained its reputation early on. Not only was this a challenging stealth map given the open plan glassed up building it's set in, but it's also the most challenging puzzle type heist in the game. People actually had a fairly difficult time initially deciphering what the three clues really meant. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that these days, but there are still some irritating features of this heist which make it more difficult. For example, guards could spot the open door to the basement back then. This meant if you wanted to safely stealth the heist, you'd have to take out all five guards, which fortunately was possible back then. If you kill four and dominate the fifth, you can make it through with only four pages going off, which is exactly how I approached it. After that, it's just another one of Payday's famous waiting games, hacking to the basement. Waiting objectives are fine during loud gameplay, but I think Overkill have gotten much better over the years at keeping stealth players on their toes throughout heists by keeping objectives much more active during stealth. Anyway, once in, it's just a case of finding the instructions and solving the reactor puzzle to bring the correct one to Bile's chopper. Movement speed with the reactor on your back was so incredibly slow at launch, I can't imagine this part would have been fun in loud. As always, Bile's landing sets off the alarm, so there's still a single assault wave worth of cops for us to worry about. Because Payday's AI pathing is not adaptive and will simply seek out target locations, it's easy enough for us to run rings around them and make a break for the escape once Bane calls to confirm the right engine was loaded up. The exact strategy I employed here to pretty good effect. Big Oil was complete. The rewards are not even close to being worth the time invested. Honestly, I think it would take months for me to hit level 100 on this account. The XP gain is just so slow. That aside, this is as complete as Launch Payday 2 is going to get. I don't have any patience left to find the overkill variant, and I don't think it would be noticeably different than the prior run, even if it did appear. So, I'm calling this challenge complete because I make the rules here, and at the very least, it was a fun nostalgia trip that was more playable than I initially expected. 
With that, I decided to use some of my remaining cash to make Worf a nice new mask before closing 2013 Payday for the last time. I'll see you in Payday 3, my sweet Swedish prince. Alright guys, that was something else. I really enjoyed taking a trip back in time and do think the release Payday has some charm to it still. It was incredibly content light at launch, which may explain the frustrating lack of a contract broker, as players were never sure if they'd seen all the heists. I remember there were always rumours flying around of an 11th secret heist at launch, and that hope really kept the game ticking over in the early days. I do think that it generally held up though. I liked the gunplay at launch, it felt slightly weightier than it does today, and there are some cool animations, such as for the Oversaw, which have strangely been lost. It wasn't as buggy as I was initially expecting, and the game didn't crash a single time, which is testament to how Payday's current instability has been caused by the many years of spaghetti-coded updates. Music and heist intensity holds up incredibly well, and with the barebones tools we had access to, everything feels like a real uphill struggle. The dark souls of heisting games, shall we say. I also love the sense of progression early on, and having to make tough decisions on where to spend my hard-earned cash. This has definitely been lost with payday bank accounts going through some serious hyperinflation since cash became virtually defunct after update 100. I also loved how menacing special enemies felt, with a single green dozer potentially changing the fortunes of your entire crew. I do believe stealth needed a makeover, and it got that in the end, although I can appreciate what the original intention was with Payday 2's launch system. I feel like nowadays I'm punished for making mistakes, but back then you'd be punished for just being unlucky. Even so, I still got dozens of hours out of it and enjoyed them for the most part. So, if CrimeNet is your friend, I can confirm that you can beat 2013 Payday 2 in 2021. Should you? Probably not. As ever, thank you very much to my mean infamy patrons and above. If you want to join that infamous club to see yourself in the credits or get early exclusive access to my videos, including the story videos, check out my Patreon link below. Remember that Discord is open to all if you crave some more payday discussion. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I'll see you all very soon for the next one.